Here we are coming close to St. John of the Desert. It is a monastery very close to Ain Kerem, and we're going to go inside, learn about how incredible this place is from one of the Franciscans who helped to restore it, and talk about contemplative prayer. Follow me. Here in the Monastery of St. John of the Desert, one of my favorite places to come is this cave. For me, entering into a cave is like entering into the heart of Christ, and that's exactly what contemplative prayer is. In fact, the friars who take care of St. John of the Desert, this monastery, who live here and keep it open for visitors to come and pray, they follow the example of St. Francis. One of his favorite places in Italy is actually a very large cave. And he says, I want to enter into the crack of that cave. I want to lay my head on to the rock because I want to feel the solidity and the unmovingness of the love of God. I want to be hidden inside of his love. This is what we are doing right now in this place of contemplation. The tradition says that John the Baptist was hidden here as a child. In fact, right here in this cave, there is a part of the rock which makes like an alcove, but it's very clearly cut away. Where was the rock taken? You can see it in Ein Karim, in the church that's, well, the, the Byzantine area church, right below the new church of the visitation. And that's where they say that Elizabeth ran when Herod was trying to kill all of the children around Bethlehem, because this is fairly close to Jerusalem, it's close to Bethlehem. And he was killing all children two years old and younger. She knew about this cave, she came, she hid him. And she saved him. Then later as he grew up, the tradition says that he went to the desert. He may have gone to many deserts, and tradition says this is one of them. There's evidence of pilgrims coming here and praying in different moments. One of my favorites, and this is what I want to read, is from an anonymous 12th century pilgrim. And he left a mention of this monastery here, this chapel in the desert. And this is what it says. Leaving the visitation, which is where this rock is, we decided to continue for another two or three miles to visit the desert where St. John the Baptist, guided and comforted by the Holy Spirit, spent his childhood until the day of his manifestation to Israel, preaching the baptism of penitence. When we reached the desert, following a very difficult and dangerous path, we were filled with joy at seeing a place that was so austere and beautiful. Although now there is not as many trees as apparently there were in the past, it is very rough and harsh and far from any human settlement. The cave where the saint dwelled, celebrated in the hymn that is sung in church, is hollowed out in the rock in the middle and at the beginning of the slope of a mountain covered with shrubs, and which immediately becomes a precipice, which is right in front of us, looking into the depths of the valley opposite. This cave is very large inside, and at the back has a raised part like an altar, where the saint used to sleep, which is now made into an altar. <laughs> so its entrance is very difficult and narrow, but once you are there, 
there is a spring of very good water. I hope you can hear it. It's right here. We can hear it right outside, which can be drawn on from above and below. On top, there is a small church and a small monastery of which only some parts of the walls, which have almost all crumbled, can be seen. And of course, his father explained it was rebuilt, renewed, and he had a huge hand in that. Where does this take us? The cave, the spring, right back to the well. It's as if the Lord is waiting for us right here. And he's saying to us, if you knew the gift of God, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. That's exactly what we're doing. Let's remember back on Ash Wednesday when we talked about St. Teresa of Jesus. When she speaks about prayer, remember, she said it's like a garden. Prayer is for the virtues. Prayer is for the fruits and the flowers. And they need water. They need many things. But her analogy is water. And that is prayer. And so what you have to do, get rid of the rocks and the weeds as much as you can so that the sower can sow a seed and it can take root. But you need to find a well. Lower the bucket, bring up that water, and take it to the troughs, to the flowers, so that they can grow. Now, as things get better and you grow, like we talked about with meditation, it's as if you've put in um, a pump. You've built canals or channels through your orchard, through your garden. And so the water comes much more easily. You have to still do some work, of course. But then she says, what is contemplation? There are days in a garden like the one here where it rains, or there's like a cloud that settles over the garden. The moisture just comes into the plants, into the trees, and into the flowers. And you do nothing, but you sit there, and you also become just overcome with this grace, this life. That is contemplation, according to St. Teresa of Jesus. It's a place where you can rest and be silent. And so St. Teresa actually defines contemplation this way. Contemplative prayer, in my opinion, is nothing else than a close sharing between friends. It means taking time frequently to be alone with him who we know loves us. Friends. That means that we have grace inside. We're the friend of God. We have his life inside. That means there's mutual knowledge. I know him. And he knows me. I've opened up my soul. Frequent. That means there's a habit. We speak to each other. It's not just once every Sunday, once every month, once every Easter or Christmas. And being alone. That's the experience of being loved and loving. You know, you're alone with someone, and that's what it is. Now, another way, one of my other, actually my absolute favorite book of the Bible is the Song of Songs, and it also speaks about, I think it's really a treatise on contemplative prayer. One of the parts of the song says, I seek him whom my heart loves, or him whom my soul loves. That's the very beginning, I seek him. I look for the spring, I look for this cave, I look to be alone and to speak with him. It talks about a well, it talks about many things, but we have to remember who is seeking his face. We are. Who sought his face in the Old Testament? Moses. I seek your face, it says specifically in Exodus. Who else? Elijah. Seeking the face of God, and it was revealed to them both. I seek the face of God, just like them. And seek means to be moved by desire. You know, many saints say that heaven will be the fulfillment of our desire. And so our, certainly our work, or one of the things we do here on earth, is to increase this desire. This desire is increased when we know him more. Because when it's, there's such goodness that's revealed, we can't help but desire more. And he's infinite. So the greater the desire, the greater the fulfillment. Seek to desire. And we know that desire is the beginning of love to seek God. It means to be born of him. It means living in him. Now going back to this word alone, as Teresa was mentioning, just like in this cave, it's like an inner space, an intimate space. And there's nothing here except the call to attention, full attention on the Lord himself. 
I think this is why so many people go to the desert. I'm very attracted to the desert. There's nothing there except for the Lord. And in many ways, I have to say, I'm just going to give you an example of my experience. The first time I went to a desert <laughs> with the Sisters of Bethlehem. They're an order from France, and they have several monasteries here. And you can pray before the Blessed Sacrament, before the Eucharist, which is very fulfilling. But they also have in each hermitage a chapel, and all you have is an icon. You have a Bible, you have an icon of Christ, and you have Mary, an icon of Mary. But you don't have the Blessed Sacrament. And I'm not used to that. I'm more used to that, praying with the Eucharist. So I was up in my hermitage and just kneeling and just being quiet and alone. And what it brings you to do is to look inward. What happens is you find him in a way that's very different, but you find him so present as the Trinity dwelling within you. It sounds mystical, but it's just the reality of God's life inside. And this attentiveness, this quiet, this innerness, this aloneness with him allows us to touch that and to experience it. And that changes us. It's like diving into water. You can't help but come out just soaking wet. We're dripping with the grace of God. This is being alone and seeking. It implies making time, of course, for the Lord, not just when one has time. It means making time, looking for the cave, looking for frequency. And that's when the secrets of the heart will be revealed. So there is a firm determination, which is essential in contemplation, a firm determination to make the time and the space, to find that cave, and then also to keep coming back. Even when the fountain is dry, never give up. Even when the well runs dry, like the book that I mentioned at the very beginning, because he is there and he wants to give me a drink. So the desert, really contemplation, the heart is a place of quest and it is a place of encounter. So I just want to answer then, what does it mean to enter into contemplative prayer? Well, I love the fact that in this cave there is an altar. The bed of John the Baptist, some say, as I said at the beginning. It's like entering into the Eucharistic liturgy. We say in the Roman Rite, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. So what is that? It's a recollection and a gathering up of my heart. It's taking it up and prompted by the Spirit. We realize that we are actually the Lord's dwelling place. He abides here. And this is his living together. Secondly, it's an awakening of faith to enter into his presence, to close my eyes and to say, oh my gosh, he's right here. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and he's waiting for me, like he was waiting for the Samaritan woman, just waiting to give the gift. Thirdly, this means that our masks fall away. This is that knowing. He knows who I am, frequent confession, I realize who I am, I open myself to him, and we turn our hearts over to him. We turn ourselves over to the Lord, because we know that he loves us. And not only do we turn to him, but we hand our entire selves over to him as an offering to be purified and transformed. That's the Eucharist, and that is contemplative prayer. So when you assist at the Eucharist, when you go to Mass, remember that when you see the altar, when you see what's happening. So I just want to name, I think it's eight characteristics of contemplative prayer inside this place. And the first one is contemplative prayer is the prayer of the children of God. That means everyone is called to contemplation, not just a few, not just the monks and the nuns, every single person Every Christian is called to this intimacy. And this means the forgiven sinner. <laughs> this means that we want to return the love we've received from God by loving him more and loving others more. This also means a poor and humble surrender to the, willing, to the loving will of the Father. This is contem contemplation. In fact, those are things that we can look at and say, okay, how is my prayer? Does it bring me to this? Do I have that same spirit? Okay, another characteristic then. 
Contemplative prayer is a gift, meaning it's a grace. I can't make it happen. I can find the spring, I can find my cave, I can really put all my effort in to quiet and to really be attentive to the Lord, but it's always a grace. It's always a gift. So I need to accept it in humility and in poverty. I need to realize I can't control it. But because it's a gift and a grace, it also means that it's a covenant relationship. If you remember, uh, for those of you who've had the chance to visit Siena in Italy, in her contemplative prayer, the Lord made her his spouse. This, uh, I think it's mystical spouse of the Lord. But also remember the Coptic sister that we found, uh, that we spoke with. She has that tattoo on her finger. I am a Christian. I'm completely yours. I am completely your bride. Written upon his heart, written upon my heart. That's actually what it says in Jeremiah covenant relationship. And it's also communion in which the Trinity conforms us into God's image. You know, I think that's why many of us, when we come into contact with contemplative sisters or monks or whatever, there's something that's just brilliant about them. It's like the Trinity is coming out from them. They're like a, an icon that's glistening in the world. It's because the Trinity is there and they realize that they've abandoned themselves to that covenant relationship and you can sense it. It's like a, a bright spot of God's presence in the world. What's another characteristic of contemplative prayer? It's an intense prayer. It's like, you know, when I think about this, an intense kiss. Usually when that happens, people's faces are red once they come apart. Or if you've ever seen a child nursing, once it's finished nursing, it's been so intense and the face is red and it's calm and happy. That is contemplative prayer. It's that type of intensity, intense experience of the other. The Father strengthens us in our inner being through the Holy Spirit and we come out stronger. Think about Jesus in Gethsemane. The apostles saw him weak, sweating, fearful, ugh and he came out strong, just like John, probably from here, or any uh, father in the desert. St. Paul actually writes to the Ephesians in chapter three, Christ, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we may be grounded in love. Grounded, how can I be a solid Christian? How is my intimate, intense contemplative prayer with the Lord? What's a fourth characteristic? Contemplative prayer is a gaze of faith, looking at him. That's why icons are so powerful, crucifixes are so powerful, reading about him in the gospel is so powerful. My eyes fixed on the Lord. It's like John the Baptist when he was in uh, the desert and he baptized and he said, there is the Lamb of God. He recognized him immediately because his eyes were fixed on God. He knew the promises that were coming. He knew his mission. His own father and mother probably told him from the very beginning. His eyes were fixed on the Lord. And if I focus on Christ, suddenly my focus isn't here. My focus isn't, it's on the compass of the world. It purifies my heart from myself. And this light illumines my eyes with truth. His love moves my heart. And I have compassion for those that I wouldn't have compassion for. How did Francis go and embrace and kiss a leper when he was so appalled before that? He fixed his eyes on Christ. This is what contemplative prayer does. It's a gaze on the mysteries of Christ's life so that we have an experiential knowledge of the Lord. I remember one of my first contemplative experiences, okay, so praying and just getting into the gospel passage about catching fish. And I found myself in my prayer on a boat on the Sea of Galilee with a net full of fish. And I, in my prayer, heard the Lord said, come follow me. And I was like, look at all these fish, look at this net. He's like, leave it, let go. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Look at all this. There's, are you kidding me? Let go, come here. I just want you to be with me. I don't forget that experience. When you have an experience of gazing on him, we never forget. We know him more to follow him more closely, says Ignatius of Loyola. This is what contemplation does. A few other characteristics, contemplative prayer is hearing the word of God, hearing him. 
You know, many times if we have a, a, the Bible that we read daily or if we go to daily mass and there's a, the reading, usually at least there's one word or a phrase that jumps out at us. In our Lumina, this book, which is just the lights, which strikes me, I write down one word or I keep it in my mind and I repeat it. I repeat it. It's like the Spirit bringing us closer and closer to the Lord. It's attentiveness to obedience and faith. Participating in the yes of the Son. I also am able to say fiat because he said, I am here to do your will, O Father, and I can say fiat with him. Very clear characteristic of contemplative prayer is silence. I think that's why people go to the desert or find a place so far away from everything like a monastery. St. Isaac of Nineveh, that means in Iraq, he was um, a church father. He wrote that silence is the symbol of the world to come. In other words, it's heaven. It's heaven. When you really know someone, words aren't necessary, are they? You're there, happy, enjoying their presence, being filled by their presence. You notice what they need, what they like, what they do, body language. This is the silence of contemplative prayer. And words aren't speeches, they're not discourses, they're not reasoning. Words, says St. John of the Cross, are the kindling for the fire in the heart. These lamps of love that burn in these caves. This is what's beautiful. In silence, the Son of God, remember, was born in Bethlehem. He suffered in Gethsemane. He rose from the dead in a cave in silence the silence of Easter Vigil, and it allows us to share in the life and the prayer of Jesus himself. What are the last two characteristics of contemplative prayer that I want to share? Contemplative prayer is unity with Christ. It's unity with Christ's Eucharist in that sense. Thanksgiving, offering, sacrifice, resurrection, salvation. It makes it real in our own lives. And that look of understanding when I know this, when somebody is contemplative, you're just like, they have a wisdom that I trust. For a spiritual director, find somebody who is a person of prayer. That's a person with the experience of the Lord who knows him and is wise. And finally, and certainly I would say most importantly, contemplative prayer is a communion of love. It's life-giving love. When someone is in love, life always comes, and it's life for the multitude. We abide in the night of faith. And that just means beyond my human senses, okay? I might not see, touch, smell, whatever. That's very meditative, right? But when I have had an experience of the love of God, and I have an experience of who He is and how much He loves me, my memory does not fail. Have you ever forgotten the person that you first fell in love with? Do we forget the love of our mother or father or caregiver? We can't forget it. It's experiential. It touches the depths of our heart and soul, and it moves us and it changes us. That's what contemplation is, an experience of Him that brings me through any darkness, any lack of... I have this faith in this experience of Him. So, that Paschal candle, Easter Vigil night, so dark. There's that flame of love. And that is the beauty of contemplative prayer. We share in the mystery of what happens, of the mystery of the Lord, the mystery of his love, and he dwells inside. So from this place, this beautiful place in the desert of St. John the Baptist, know that we're praying and have prayed and will continue to pray for each and every one of you. And God bless you.